We're having a whole lot of fun and learning a lot from the Fantasy Fund Manager. One of the sponsors is ShareNet. Martin Strauss is a wealth manager with ShareNet who spends a lot of time looking at good opportunities. And he's got some fascinating insights about the retail sector. These are stocks that are involved in the Fantasy Fund Manager. But there's something that, well, I hadn't come across it before. Bit of a bare point. We're going to explore that with him today. Hey, Martin, good to have you on the program with us here on Biz News TV. Just to, to start off with, though, you talking about, or rather the, the note that you sent me beforehand to say, beware of these particular stocks that are in the Fantasy Fund Manager. Uh, you you uh, were highlighted a couple of international operations that are threats to these South African companies. But I see Something else that's on the horizon, and we keep getting information on it, is Amazon moving into the South African market as well. And as we well know, Amazon is the killer of retail companies pretty much all over the world. So I'd also like us to touch on that. But let's get on to your thesis first. You highlighted two international businesses that are moving quite aggressively into the South African space in digital retailing. Just unpack it for us, if you would. Yes, Alex. So we've seen over the last while that we've seen a lot of market share actually go to these companies. Uh, we are looking specifically at uh, um, Shein or Shein. Uh, the pronunciation was a big debate in the household, but it looks like it is Shein is actually the pronunciation of the company. And then also Temu, um, which is another big uh, Chinese uh Etel behemoth that is moving into our market um, and has already taken a lot of market share from our clothing retailers, specifically on the side. So it is a trend that we've seen for some time. You know, it's something that we need to do on our side as portfolio managers is to see what is structural and what is more transitory. So in these instances, we feel it's a little bit, a little bit more permanent and a structural threat to, you know, the viability of our local uh, retailers. And we've seen it in the stock prices over the last you know, you can take multiple data sets, but over the last five years specifically, not a single one of our clothing retailers is in positive territory if you were a shareholder. Over five years? That's quite yeah, Over five years. So where the JSE was up, you know, in the mid-30s, or the all share was up in the mid-30s, only the food producing retailers are ones that have kind of kept up with the market. Every single one of the of the clothing retailers are down. Now, this isn't the only uh, reason for that. There are other structural problems as well uh, that these companies are facing. But, you know, this is this is something that we see as a big threat and we would not be uh, we wouldn't be owning these companies over the medium to long term at the moment. Sheen, just maybe we start with that one. Just explain exactly where they come from and why they're targeting South Africa. Yeah, so it's actually, they, they, they are not only operational in South Africa. Um, so Sheehan was actually started in 2008 in China. Um, they've gone from strength to strength. They have a very digitized operation. They have a very uh, user-friendly app that is used globally. And they have very, very strong search engine optimization, picking up fashion trends and uh, places to be or, or the clothes that they need to make or, you know, what is appealing to customers at the moment. And last year, they were the second, only only behind Amazon as uh, the most downloaded app uh, in the US uh, for shopping specifically. Um, and at the moment, they are uh, they they aren't listed yet, so all the information isn't publicly available. But we, the last numbers we got, they were about a hundred billion uh, dollar company already. So they're bigger than you know, or they are comparable to something like H and M and Zara combined. They're big competitors. Have you been playing with the apps? Um, not myself. It's more for it's more for uh, for the ladies at the moment. So you know, in the spirit of Women's Month, I thought uh, and Women's Day tomorrow, I thought it would be a, a nice topic to chat about. Uh, my wife has used it before. Um, you know, she, she's pregnant, so a lot of the maternity where she's um, she's actually purchasing from them because it's you know it's fast moving uh, uh, um, clothing which actually gets you know uh, it's used for a season and then actually you know uh, thrown out, which is why they are not. Uh, you know, they're a little bit of a pariah for, you know, your ESG investors as well. So this is really interesting. It's your wife is already using it. Have, has the fulfillment been good from their side? 
It has. The clothing is, you know, of a decent quality. Um, it is trendy. It is. They do follow, you know, what is happening on social media with their algorithms quite, uh, you know, quite effectively. And, uh, I mean, the experience is good. You get your clothes within uh, 8, to, 8 to 12 days of ordering it. Um, and, I mean, it, it, it's, it comes at a third or, uh, you know, half or even a third of the price of what you would be paying at our local retailers as well. So that's why it's such a big player, not only in South Africa, but globally. It's extraordinary that nobody has really picked up on it uh, to the degree that, that it needs to be because this is a massive yes. threat, uh, not even talking about Amazon. So who are the companies that would be particularly affected by this? Maybe just because uh, they're all in the fantasy fund manager. Maybe you can. Uh, yeah. So the clothing retailers specifically. So we would look at uh, the Fashini group, um, you know, Mr. Price specifically, Pepco, um, Woolies to some extent, but Woolies is, you know, I think Woolies has, is more defensive in nature. The same with ShopRite. Um, and pick and pay who also, you know, are in the clothing space, but it's not a big portion of their operating profits or their revenues. So specifically the ones that are just, uh, you know, specializing in clothing retail, those are the ones that we feel are under the most threat. But you can also pick up the trends and you will see that, you know, one of the other competitors that are that's potentially coming into the market with big money backing it, like Tamu, uh, which is the most downloaded shopping app in the U.S. this year, is also moving into other merchandise. So it's not just clothing. It's actually they're moving into, you know, kitchenware or uh, technology as well. So these guys would, you, you mentioned Amazon in the beginning of the uh, of the interview. And I mean, um, they, they, they're they competing directly with Amazon and taking on, you know, the giants of the industry as well. So uh, for us, it's concerning. And, and how would our local retailers respond to this? What about Amazon? The uh, There's a very uh, good lady... Uh, sorry, good source of information on Twitter, um, a, a somebody who's in the office space, who uh, her name escapes me at the moment, but she often talks about what's happening there and who's coming in. And she tweeted something last week to say that Amazon are on their way. They're coming. They're coming into the South African market. Now, it's been an open secret for a while. If Amazon were to launch here, you'd immediately think that there'd be an impact on the NASPES subsidiary take a lot. But surely these clothing retailers are now becoming a highly contested area. Yeah, I mean, and they've already, uh, you know, they've already uh, been taking cooking from Amazon in the US already. So, you know, uh, Amazon does has had the distribution center in Cape Town for some time. We knew they were on the way. But one thing that Amazon wouldn't have uh, particularly is, you know, low cost labor. Uh, which China has. They're basically exporting um, that entire supply chain at a very low cost to the entire to, to the entire world at the moment. Um, and they have a, a very, very effective digital platform. I know Amazon has that as well, and that's why it's one of the biggest companies in the world. But, you know, Amazon's on the way along with the rest of them, and they will be competing. And, you know, where's that going to leave the likes of a Fashini Group or a Mr. Price or a, or a Pepco? Wow. Okay, so we've kind of done the bear case for those mm. uh, stocks and uh, presumably you don't have them in your portfolio in your own fantasy fund manager uh, portfolio. No, those aren't um, ones that I've been owning. I've been, uh, I had ShopRite, which I thought would be a little bit more defensive in tough economic conditions uh, and high inflation and high uh, interest rate environment that we're finding ourselves in at the moment. Um, but I mean, even something like, even something like Pick and Pay, Alec, you know, they, they they made a billion rand in profits last year and they spent half a billion on, on diesel for generators. So, you know, you don't want to come wax lyrical about, you know, maybe these guys didn't see it coming. I think they could have, management teams could have responded a little bit quicker to what was happening here. But it's also difficult to ask these companies to be investing heavily in infrastructure if the operating environment where they have to do their business you know, isn't conducive to it, right? It's uh, these companies are getting affected by it, and we, and we're seeing it in the share price. So um, I found something like a shop right would be a little bit more defensive. I'm still owning it for my fantasy fund manager, um, and uh, but but you know, at least for the medium to long term, um, you know, South African clothing retail for me is. Uh, under threat, they are trying to, you know, launch their own digital platforms as well to compete. Uh, I just think it's a little bit late. And again, you cannot compete with, um, you know, a product that's a third of the price, uh, irrespective of where it comes from. Yeah, indeed. So you have the Chinese 
digital retailers who presumably are sourcing from Chinese manufacturers and they'd have much, a much uh, keener negotiating skills there in their home market than the South African retailers who are now trying to get into the digital market belatedly. And a lot of their product would also be sourced from China where not too many of them speak the language. So it makes a lot of sense. They'd be on the back foot. Yeah, so there is a lot of, um, you know, I did mention the ESG investor would not be looking at these companies at the moment. They have been in the news. Uh, she in specifically has been in the news for the wrong reasons from unfair labor practices in the provinces where these uh, predominantly the manufacturing takes place to stealing designs from up and coming designers. They've been sued by the likes of Ralph Lauren and Levi Strauss for, uh, you know, IP theft. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a squeaky clean business. And, you know, she in, uh, I know they are looking for an IPO in the U.S. specifically at the end of the year, but this is the kind of stuff that the SEC is going to look at and say, well, you know, firstly, you know, where are these things coming from? Um, uh, so it's, it, it's, it's a problem, right? So, um, for it's that whole consciousness versus convenience debate that comes into play again. And, uh, you know, maybe that is something where our local retailers can look at, you know, going for more a local is like a theme and marketing that and trying to ensure that, um, you know, South African buyers are actually buying from South Africa. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how that pans out. Are the South African buyers, the consumers, would they pay much attention to these negative factors for the Chinese digital retailers, do you think? Well, Alec, I think when you when you are in a situation where you know you have to tighten the belt, it's the environment we're finding ourselves in at the moment. Um, I'm not going to be maybe as conscious about where uh, these you know these goods come from. Um, they are not as inelastic as food, for example, but it is still kind of an inelastic purchase. One does need clothes, right? Um, so I think that. It, it, it is a concern, most definitely. Um, and like I said, we'll just have to see how how, how, uh, how that transpires. Martin, what about the impact on Take-A-Lot? Uh, it's a tiny part of NASPAS's uh, portfolio, mm. so it's, it's surely not going to affect the share price. But Take-A-Lot has been around for a long time. It's a good operation, but it, I don't think it's ever made money. And now it's getting these new competitors that uh, with Amazon coming around the corner, doesn't look like a very happy place to be. No, I would be concerned. Um, just for the mere fact, again, uh, the pure pricing power that these guys have to be able to produce these goods and export it and bring it into South Africa at a third or even a half of the price, catering for all kinds of LSMs. I mean, you have you have uh, WhatsApp groups among among ladies in, in, in you know high end estates that are. Uh, you know, they, they're communicating with each other as to when, you know, they are buying from Xi'an. I mean, you've got uh, people in, in, in maybe rural areas or people who, um, you know, come from, uh, you know, in your in your townships, which are looking at purchasing Xi'an products for resale. So it is affecting the entire LSM sphere. And for someone like Superbalist, whose app might not be as um, as effective, uh, I mean, what the, what's happening at the moment is you can take a picture of a garment or clothing item that you like when walking into an Edgar's. You can post it onto the app and it will find you something that is similar at a third of the price. So uh, for someone like, you know, uh, uh, for Take A Lot and Superbulous specifically, I think, you know, the same and they sit with the same problem as as an Amazon. Um, how do you compete on price? Uh, uh in, in the way that the in the way that you know um, these companies are manufacturing these goods, it's a, it's it's uh, it's not a good space for me. Um, so th 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 there'd be other sectors and industries that I'd be looking at as an investor at the moment. I love the work you guys do at ShareNet. Uh, talking to Dylan Bradfield, he picked out Blue Telecoms and Telcom and made a very compelling case why he liked them so much. And now you've gone from your perspective, uh, unhatched something that not too many people have been paying attention to. Is that what gets you guys up in the morning, trying to find different areas of focus? Always, Alec. I think, um, you know, we have a massive passion for the markets. Um, we like following trends. We like following where big money is flowing to. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably more of a specialist on the offshore side. Um, our office also runs the, the, the offshore active portfolios for ShareNet. So uh, we've been doing that for some time. That is our background. So we are following the offshore trends, but also, you know, it, it's very easy then to kind of 
put the puzzle together and to see how it's going to affect our local companies, uh, you know, when you have structural issues like this. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting to follow the news. It's interesting to follow trends and it's a, it's something new every day, right? So that's why, uh, that's why it will, it definitely gets up, us up in the morning and it's not difficult to, uh, um, to get involved. Yeah. And joining the dots, as you say, from the offshore side, we've certainly seen it this news as well that when we had the pandemic uh, there was an acceleration of um, of our business because of its digital nature and what mm. you've just outlined here is a similar thing that it, it's catching on quickly we may be caught up or went five years ahead in in just uh, a year and a half but from your perspective what is looking good then uh, we now know on fantasy fund manager i'm going to get rid of I think I might even have Fashini as my pick in that area. I'm going to get away from that one. Uh, but what stocks in the game are appealing to you? So I'm going to go a little bit more traditional. and I'm going to go with a company that, um, that I actually worked for for a long time, um, Standard Bank. So I think it's, you know, it is defensive in nature. You're sitting with a bank that has, um, it is the biggest bank on the continent, um, so to speak. It has actually held up really well on the retail banking side with digital competitors coming into the market as well. Uh, it's got a very strong corporate investment banking side, strong foreign exchange. Uh, and, you know, if I'm looking just from a valuation perspective, I mean, the bank is, it's, it's one of the only banks that are, that's actually up this year as well. Uh, it's paying you a 6% dividend yield. It had a really good trading statement that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it had 35% uh, headline earnings per share increase uh, for that six-month period when they reported. Uh, and they are benefiting from an increasing interest rate environment. Um, so they're paying you a 6% dividend yield. Uh, the PE ratio is sitting at about, or the current PE is sitting about, at about nine times. Uh, you know, it's, it's eight times forward. Uh, uh, earnings is what it's looking like at the moment. So if you're getting 11% in earnings growth expected plus a 6%, uh, you know, dividend that it's throwing uh, off as well, you know, 17% growth in the current environment over the next, expected over the next year, um, I'd bag it and move on. So um, that would be my pick for, uh, for, for, uh, for today. Why are banks so cheap in South Africa, banking shares? You can't really always value banks just on PE ratios. We like to look at the price to book ratios as well. So they would be, you know, uh, I think Standard Bank is sitting on a, a 1.6 price to book ratio. Uh, it is a little bit more expensive than its peers. But uh, I think for good reason, uh, that premium on the valuation is something that, um, you know, that uh, it, it's justified in Standard Bank's instance, just because of the factors that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, it's a really strong player and uh, the biggest bank on the continent. So, um, from from a banking perspective, we rather like to look at uh, those price to book or those price to net asset value valuations. So, Standard Bank, uh, I think it was last I saw about a third of its profits are coming from Africa outside of South Africa, and that's growing rapidly uh, in South Africa. Very strong franchise as well. And you prefer mm. that to First Rand? I prefer to first round at the moment. Um, so I'd also prefer it to the likes of of, of Nedbank and Absa. Uh, Capitec has obviously been a really strong player um, for a, a, a very, very long time. Um, but we feel that, you know, maybe the data's book of a standard bank might be of a little bit higher quality um, with the increasing rate environment that we are experiencing at the moment, even though, you know, the net interest margins might move up on the banks. At the same time, the quality of the data's book or maybe provisions for bad debts could be increasing at the same time. So uh, it is something that we would be aware of. Um, so, you know, compared to maybe something like a Capitec, I would prefer to be in either a first train or a standard bank. I think they are the best out of the bunch. But uh, for me, I prefer the standard bank play just because of that strong African presence uh, in, in, in maybe uh, a population which is slightly more unbanked than, you know, the local market here in South Africa. Well, you've certainly convinced me, Martin. Thank you. I'll be adjusting my <laughs> portfolio next week. Martin Strauss is a wealth manager at ShareNet, one of the platinum sponsors of the Fantasy Fund Manager competition. And I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 